Dude, you gave him the Punisher mug? Yeah. All right, you're about to see me fucking. <laughs> I'm going to see it. Bro, and you and what'd you get me? Oh. Just the fucking little black just, nothing mug? Just, yeah. just the target. <laughs> Dude, that is a fuck. That is kind there's of almond milk in that one, so you yeah, can't even that's interchange why I can't, it. There's a, I can't do a no, fucking thing about you're gonna, it. You're gonna uh, get to watch it. Can you believe the that? Whole Look, time. It's gonna, can you believe that? Ash? See, they're trying to light a fire. A two brute. And I'm man. having pimple, pimple mousse. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> Whatever there this is. is. Today's episode <laughs> sponsored by. I mean, there must have been some thought in giving him the pun. I didn't see the logo. Oh, you did. I mean, I've spent not in a professional capacity, but oh, mm -hmm. we're we're filming. Okay, no, 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 we're just going. We're just lighting up. Yeah, we were just um, yeah. Not in a professional capacity, but I was like, you know, on a personal level, we spent time together, but not enough enough time together for me to see that sincere side of you and the compassionate side of you and the thoughtful and the very intuitive side of you, but not the vulnerable side of you. Like we haven't been in that situation yet. Or like the side of you, like I've never seen you get irritated or express it. Or like let somebody see that you're irritated. Hmm, yeah. Does that make sense? It does make sense. I, I uh, That has to exist. We all have that. Sure. But I haven't seen that part of you yet. So you think you've seen, so you think you've seen. Not vulnerable. I've seen you make yourself like soften yourself for someone else's vulnerability i've seen you become who you need to become to make the other person comfortable mm -hmm. but i haven't seen you put down your guard when somebody's trying to do that with you because you're not used to being in that position i don't think i think you're used to being the one that is is making someone else feel better or that is emotionally available to someone else or is hearing maybe their trauma or how you've impacted their life including people that you also have a relationship with, not just people who come up to you on the street. I think that's what I've seen. Yeah, I mean. Uh, that's gotta be exhausting. I don't know, I don't know. I mean, cause I think that where we mostly see each other, yeah. you know, is around our kids, yeah. sports. Yep. Um, which, we'll, which, you know, we'll get into. Okay. But I don't know, I also just kinda, I don't know about you, but mm -hmm. I, I, because I think kids sports, especially, especially sort of like to the sort of like degree and yeah. like kind of level and intensity that our kids play yeah. sports at a competitive level. Yeah. At a, I, I don't know, Ash, I feel, I feel like where we see each other, you know, like at mm -hmm. these, ki these kids games, these like super fucking intense um, games that, that bring out, I think uh, the best and very often the worst in folks. Uh, it's also just like, a pl it's like, it's like totally around being there for the kids and yeah. I think I don't know about you but I think that that whether I, I like try to not put judgment on it, whether it brings out your best or your worst but I think it brings out your most not that that's where I feel kind of ar ar around kids mm -hmm. my kids other mm -hmm. people's kids it's where I feel the most natural mm -hmm. I feel mm -hmm. uh at, for at this point in my life Same. I get there's there's no kid you you really like kids love you you're so yourself you're so authentic around mm -hmm. kids that's a weird fucking word but you're just like yourself no, and 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 um as an only child it's a little who never was even sure they wanted to have a bunch of kids yeah it's kind of a i am um, it's interesting because i actually i hated babies i did not love kids when i was younger i was like oh my gosh this person has siblings if they'll just like <laughs> get out of my i was super independent like yeah on, typical only child like yeah. that was just me to a t yeah and it wasn't until i had my own kid that suddenly and and he was so tough like my first was so tough and um i had to get like thick skin and i had to pull myself together when i was being judged as a parent or when even worse when my child was being judged for any of his behavior as a toddler that was annoying to someone else um and it was through that, it was through learning how to better understand him that suddenly it was like, kids are so misunderstood. Like That's we're right. so preoccupied with ourselves or how we are being reflected in our children that That's we it. are not paying attention. That's right. We are not seeing what their needs are. And so it made me take a, you know, a look at childhood, Ashley, and like maybe what I needed more. Mm. And I swear now, not with every kid, but a lot of kids I can look and be like, ah, I, I, I feel that yeah. part of them, even yeah, when they're it. being raised by incredible sure. parents. Like sure. 
I can see them. Sure. And that's something that my oldest definitely brought out in me. And, you know, just after like our family's tragedy of my daughter passing, um, that that opened up a whole different, like almost clairvoyant connection with kids where it was really difficult for me to be around adults for a long time. Mm. And it was like, I just want to be around kids. Mm. Like mm. that's where I'm finding my most connection. I'm sure it was comforting for me, but they're just f- complete vulnerability and authentic way of expressing every emotion felt so much more safe to me instead of everyone just trying to like handle me with kid gloves or everyone trying to assess how I was feeling. Like the kids didn't care how I was feeling. Sure. They were just expressing how they were feeling and that was just a relief for me. Um, right. But like one of my best friend's daughters who was especially connected to my daughter. She was older than her, but just she was the baby in her family and Stevie was the baby in ours. And she just had this special connection with her and like babied her. And when Stevie got sick, like she took it just as hard as, you know, Stevie's brothers Mm -hmm. did. And I remember um, the day after Stevie passed, her house was one of the first I went to to go check on her. And I walked in and she just walked right up to me and she's like, how did you let her die? And then she hit me and she walked away. And it was just like, and I just walked over and I just, and her mom was like, I am so sorry. I'm like, absolutely. Mm. Like that, What I feel that. Mm. I feel that. Mm. And it was just, I just forced her into this hug of, and mm. I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know, so yes, I love kids <laughs> is yeah. what I'm getting at. Yeah. I love them. And um I'm incredibly sensitive to any pain that they're having, you know, so. I think especially, again, because of, you know, where where, where you and I have spent you yeah. know, the bulk yeah. of our time yeah. together. It is. And it's, it's such a place that's like fraught with folks trying to live through their kids and, and, and worried yes. about, you, you know, their, their kids are this like representation among, uh, uh, about themselves. And, and I, I think by kind of definition, these kids are almost labeled as sort of like high achieving because they're like good athletes, even right. though they're like prepubescent, like little Yeah, fucking, so we hold them to really unrealistic standards insane. with their and, emotional development, that's for sure. You know, you're somebody who I've wanted to, uh, from, from the moment I met you and your family, I was just so kind of in awe of you guys and 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 blown away by you guys like i love your family i love your i love your boys like i i love them and and uh you 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 know your son sawyer like i love that he he wears his heart on his sleeve and he is like incapable of masking it like i love that like i love that kid and um and 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 i've come to love your husband i've come to love you i've come to I just like I, I love you guys and 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 I think that um the the way in which you guys navigate sports the way that you navigate life the way that you navigate each other is um in 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 this thing of trying to raise a family which is so just like laden with 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 pitfalls and failures you just constantly hit walls yeah. you guys do it with this uh like integrity and honesty, like you're you're so honest about everything, and and nothing is sugar coated, nothing is, but it's always so just steeped in in love, and uh, and and you see it in everything and every move every one of you guys makes, Whew. and uh, and I'm just so in awe of it, and and it's really why like for like you're like who I wanted to kind of talk to more than anyone else, on camera or or off, like you 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 and Ben, you know, and. So I don't know. I guess like like what what is like I have to stop is, you right there and say that's like the best compliment I've ever received. It's like, just that, honest. That's, that's I, just it's like a, when when you like to be seen as what the like true intent of your heart is. You know what I mean? It's one thing to be seen for what you've been through or what you're trying to accomplish or what you have accomplished, but you know we don't always voice the intent of our heart, and especially when it comes to raising our family, like the thing that's most sacred to us, and so to to be seen for the thing that is the most important to Ben and I, like is just the whole point, right? It, how would you tell the story of your family? That's a great question because it really depends on the starting point. Ben and I have been married, and I think this is helpful too because you're like, ah, how do I do introductions? Well, that can be generally pretty easy for you because the people you're usually interviewing need no introduction, right? And so here, for a large part, mm-hmm. you know, um, or people are, if they're not familiar with them, they're familiar with their story. And you and I were joking because 
well, I was joking and you were like, no, you're the perfect fit. And I'm like, I am definitely not your typical podcast guest. Like, I'm dying to see where this goes. And I messaged Chase and I'm like, so outline, question, anything? And he's like, no, we're just going to wing it. And I'm like, that is John. Fuck it in. So here we go. Yeah, like, fuck it in. He makes it very easy to talk to. I hope so. so. In answering that question, I mean, Ben and I have been married for, I, th- gosh, this is going to be 20 years this year. Wow. I may be exaggerating. A long, we've been together for a long time. Yeah. Longer than we've been apart. And um, we definitely have one of those could be a cheesy rom-com like romances where he was exactly my type and not even my type a little bit. And I wasn't going to date and I was in college and he was a little bit older and I saw him and instantly it was like, great, I'm going to marry this guy. We hadn't even talked yet. And I knew, like I knew. And um and we you dated. You saw you sweeping up at a. Yes. At a UCSB. I was a janitor. I mean, that's not, it was called a facilities coordinator, yeah. but I mopped up vomit oh, at yeah. UCSB. There you go. And his brother yeah. was a basketball coach there, and he was there for the summer being a camp counselor for basketball. And I saw him, and I was, it, it was just instant. And um, we ended up going out like for the week that he was there because he didn't live in California. And then he left, and I was never going to see him again. I saw him again and that turned into like this two year long distance relationship that was dramatic and romantic and all of the things until I gave him the ultimatum was like either move here or this is it. Mm -hmm. And it was it. He was like, all right, it's it. And we broke up and the feeling of like life without him. And I remember um, I was like, I had grown up an atheist, not, not like my personal choice, not my parents. Um, And my faith just started to unravel and open up after I met him and I just became a lot more open and started praying a lot more and at one point when we were broken up and I just thought everything was over because I knew I was going to marry him I remember saying a prayer and just saying like God please just like let me have him I promise you like you know that whole bargaining we do do. with God where we're like Mm -hmm. if you just do this like especially when we're younger so here I am 21 and I'm making a deal with God that's like if you just give me Ben I promise you we will survive anything you throw at us like life can be as hard as you need it to be Mm -hmm. and we will survive it so long as I have him okay Mm -hmm. like deal deal and of course you know 20 years later I remember that bargain because he God held up his end. Okay, I gave him to you. But just there's such a big part of Ben and I that we both just have this confirmation that, you know, before this life even, we made a deal with each other that we were going to do this with each other, that we were going to come down here, we were going to find each other, we were going to get married, and we were going to tackle whatever life threw at us. And so I think that sort of like bigger perspective has got us through Hmm. a lot of the unexpected trials or been helped us be more patient with each other um, because it is not like what life has thrown us has not been easy on our marriage by any means. Um, and we're so far from perfect and, and we're working on it every day. But we had our first son and I was working at the time and Ben was working. And when I was pregnant, I was so, I got hyperemesis, which I don't know if you know what that is. It's basically like you can't get out of bed. You're throwing up all the time. And pregnancy is absolutely miserable. So I quit my job and I stayed home and I threw up all the time and I fell into like this deep hole of depression. And then my son was born and he was the best thing to ever happen to me. And I had not postpartum depression, but I had postpartum anxiety. And I just lived in constant fear that I was going to lose him. Hmm. And it was mostly this constant fear that if something happens to him, I I will not be able to go on and I w- didn't want people to hold him and I didn't want to leave the house and I would like check his breathing a thousand times a night and it was obsessive and it was all consuming and it took months before I realized that this was an actual hormone imbalance and disorder that women suffered from but I just thought I suck at this and so it was a little like I had already started to get better before the option of medication so I pulled through that just in time for my son to be the most difficult newborn that ever existed (laughs) and he had sleep apnea and he was sensitive to foods and he was sensitive to light and he cried all the time and he was simultaneously the happiest baby in the world and the most miserable and I was convinced that I was the problem I was convinced that I was not cut out for this and that Mm -hmm. I wasn't good with kids and that I wasn't like 
he was the best thing I had ever done and I was failing him mm. and it put a lot of strain on our marriage and we just kind of started to coexist and it wasn't really a partnership. We were just in survival mode. And it was a couple years later, you know, that that we learned a lot more and that we were able to get our son a lot more help and services and we started to educate ourselves on, you know, a lot of the sensory stuff that he was dealing with and the speech delays. And um, it was through that learning process that I built up just so much resilience, not only as a parent, but just like as a human. And I remember calling, like Googling every child psychiatrist I could after a meltdown and just thinking, I'm pregnant with my second at this point. My first is falling apart and I'm ill-equipped and I find this number of this renowned child psychologist in our area and I call her up and I give her a rundown of what's going on and she's like, I won't see your son. And I'm like, what? I'm like, I, what do you mean? And she's like, I need to see you. This is gonna be a long road for you and you're not ready for it yet. I'm gonna do you, you and your family so much more service if I give you therapy than if I give your son therapy. What, like, what, just based on the symptoms? Uh, based did on like his best chance was gonna be me being strong enough yeah, yeah. to stay patient and stay the course and not give up and stay calm while he was melting down For and sure. know what to do. And wow. I'm so grateful to her today because she saw something in, she saw that I could be capable, but that I just didn't know how and that I was so scared and that I was about to have another baby and I needed somebody to tell me I could do this and then to tell me how. And that's what she did. And it was like a dark year of therapy where we had to dig out the darkest, parts of my life first and I had to face them before I could deal with what was right in front of me. And and then that was a long road, you know? We were new parents, we had two little kids, wild boys, and we took a break for a while from having kids and we just kind of like found our way, found our rhythm, and um, then we got pregnant with my daughter. And and that was, we, we were just different parents by that point. You know, we were a lot more seasoned, we were a lot more calm, we weren't sweating the small stuff. And um, and when she was born, she was just that, Stevie, was that missing piece to our family. And not just like for Ben and I, who Ben was born to be a girl dad. And that was proof the moment she was born. Because I remember we thought she was a boy. And he was like, all right, I got this. Like, I'm such a boy dad. Like, this is great. And I was definitely a boy mom and was so excited for that. And we found out it was a girl. We were both just like, well, now what? What do we do? Turns out Ben is should have a million girls, should be raising a million girls because he is a girl dad. And um, and she brought something out in my boys, which our kids are the same age, it, like relatively the same age, and we had them in the same order. And so I imagine you can relate because I've seen your boys with little girls, including their sister. Mm -hmm. And it is very familiar to me and it is a sight to behold. And it's something that Stevie brought out in my boys that wasn't there before. And so when she passed away, um, which I'll explain in a minute, um, it was like that was just ripped from them and ripped from their story that was already starting to unfold. And it was almost like losing a limb for them. Like, what do you mean? I'm. This was meant to be a part of my life. It was given to me. This is how it was going to be. It, it unlocked this part of my heart and my soul and my personality. And now it's just gone. And the softness in them vanished with that. Hmm. And, and it it was like soul crushing for me as a mom to see that go away and to think like, how am I supposed to pull that back out of them? Like how, like, and now they're guarded. So um, Stevie was two and the spunkiest, spiciest little two-year-old ever and meeting all of her milestones and doing great and just my little sidekick. And then you know, then she was talking and then she just started talking less. And then she just went from being super happy to being a little bit irritable sometimes. And she went from being a great sleeper to waking up in the middle of the night every now and then crying. All things that didn't phase us because we had already dealt with the impossible that were like, we got this. She's just terrible twos. And, um, and as her speech started to not improve, as a mom who'd already gone through this, I recognized the signs and I got her evaluated for autism. I got her evaluated for speech delay. We got blood work. We we did all of the things and everything kind of came back as just, she's just a little delayed. She has older brothers. She'll catch up. Everything else about her is like perfectly normal. We don't see bigger problems here. 
And my gut was just knew, like just knew that there was more. And we were at the height of the pandemic. The kids were now out of school. We were in lockdown. And this was, when I say the height, I mean like we were only allowed to go to the grocery store during a certain time of the day. All doctor's offices were closed. No one you knew was going to the hospital because we were terrified. We still didn't know like if we caught this, were we going to survive? I mean, it was literally the walking dead. It was like, are we going to turn into like, what's going to happen? So we're living in the state of fear, right? And we're in our house and we're just locked down in our little cozy isolation. And it was just like overnight, her, like her motor skills started to decline. Suddenly she would like walk a little crooked or she went from being like super agile and athletic to not catching the ball when we threw it to her and she wasn't sleeping anymore and she would have temper tantrums, things that she didn't really do before. And um, and she, one day she would just like stare off into space for like a minute and then she would come back to us. And I called her pediatrician again after the blood work came back normal and I sent her pediatrician a video because we couldn't go see her. And I said, look at how she's walking. Like she's stumbling and she's bumping into the wall just walking down our hallway. And the pediatrician said, I, like, I want you to take her to Children's Hospital right now. I'm going to call ahead because, again, you had to call ahead to even get in. Right. And I'm going to make sure that they have, like, a safe wing for you to go into. And so it was, like, 7 at night, the night before Easter. And I remember Ben saying, like, let's just go in the morning. Like, she's been walking like this for a couple days. And, like, the boys have Easter baskets in the morning. And we have a whole thing. Like, she's almost ready. It's almost her bedtime. And my gut was like, I have to go now. I, ha- I was just in this, this part of me just unlocked, like this intuition just unlocked. And I put her in the car and drove down to downtown LA. And I just remember on that drive, like she's in her car seat and she's just babbling back there and she's not crying. She's not, she doesn't know where we're going. And I'm holding the steering wheel, like in the car by myself. And I'm just like squeezing it and just like knowing I'm driving into like a new chapter of my life. Like just my gut knew. I didn't know what I was going to face, but I knew like they weren't just going to send me home. Like I just knew. And um, we got to Children's Hospital and, you know, I never saw another child the whole time I was there. Pandemic. Sure. So what you like come to expect um, from Children's Hospital was not our experience there. We didn't get the clowns. We didn't get the dogs visiting. We didn't get the puppet shows and the, the joy that, you know, it was it was a scary place at that time and it was dark and it was quiet and it was everyone was afraid of everything and i had to get a covid test she had to get her first covid test which was miserable for a 2 year old and we waited forever and um and then we the doctor came in and i just described all of her symptoms and like okay we're going to give her they watched her try to walk and they didn't even question like we're going to put her in for a scan and i was like okay we're going to get answers but why didn't they try to rule out a million other things? Like, how quickly do you put a three-year-old in a scan? Like, you don't, you don't do that. So I was really nervous. And um, I had to, like, they had to put her in a straight jacket for it. it. These are all just, like, the things that I can go on and on about that were so traumatic at the time that replay in my head at the worst possible times because I was alone there doing this. You know what I mean? Like, a lot of times, every other time our kids got sick or needed stitches, Ben and I called someone to come over with the other kids and we went together and like we held each other's hands. Like even we're talking even for like basic shots and checkups. We were the parents who went to the pediatrician together. And so here I am putting my daughter in a straitjacket while she's screaming for her dad. Not me because I'm the villain here making her get shots and tests. And um, and she comes out and they were able to sedate her a little bit and I was able to get her to sleep. And I'm sitting in this little like private room and a social worker walks in. And that was when I was like, damn it. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not, I, I'm not stupid. Like, I know why there's a social worker in here. And she was like, we're going to have somebody from, you know, we're going to have a child behaviorist come in here to sit with Stevie um, and you're going to come with me. And it was, this was like a really fast process. In hindsight, I realize that now, but it felt like, 10 days because I knew I was about to hear something that wasn't going to be good. And she, she walked me into this small, empty, like conference room with like no windows and just chairs in this U shape. And I'm waiting there and five doctors walk in in their lab coats and they all have masks on and I can't see their faces and they sit down and I'm just looking at their eyes 
and she's sitting next to me. And, you know, the doctor who goes to speak, I'm forever grateful for this moment of humanity because, again, all the controversy about masks came later. At this point, no one was questioning it. It was like, don't even let me remotely see this part of your face. And he just grabbed, he started to talk, and he, I just saw him get frustrated. I knew he was a parent in that moment. Yeah. Don't remember his name. Don't remember one person in that room's name. Yeah. Like, that is all blacked out to me. And he just takes his mask and he pulls it down and talks to me and and says worst thing I could hear. And they let me know in that moment um, that she had a really sizable brain tumor and that it was likely cancerous, but that they couldn't determine that until we got an MRI. And everyone who did the MRI was out because of Easter. And so they were going to try to get me in as soon as possible, but they were going to admit her and to call my husband and let him know. And at that time, I'm think I remember sitting there like going into warrior mom mode, not letting myself like I didn't cry. And I even like hate to admit it, but went so far as to like I disassociated in the point like I didn't break down, I didn't go numb, I became hyper aware. I became hyper aware of every single person in that room. I became hyper aware of the social worker sitting next to me. And I remember thinking like, I wonder if she's wondering why I'm not crying. Hmm. I wonder if she's like, why isn't she crying? She just received, I wonder if the doctors are thinking, thank God this isn't my kid. Like I started hmm. thinking about how I could make hmm. everyone else in that room more comfortable because they had to deliver the worst news to me and how uncomfortable that must be for them. It was like, hmm. that was, it was safer for me to go there than it was to think about what I was gonna have yeah. to go through. And the social worker, like, again, I don't remember her face. If I saw her today, I wouldn't recognize her. Like, also, cause she had a mask on, that's probably why. Um, but she takes her hand and she's like, put it on my leg. And then like, whoosh, I just came back in my body. And she said, are there any questions you wanna ask? And I said, I, no, I, I, don't, I don't even know what to ask right now. And, um, and so, we got admitted and um, and the shittiest part of the whole thing was having to call Ben. And after receiving the worst news you can imagine receiving um, alone, then having to relay that same news to the person you love more than anything in the world, knowing that it's gonna do to them exactly what it did to you. So having to be the one to receive it and then having to be the one to deliver it, like that phone call is burned in my brain. And it's also burned in my brain knowing that when I hung up how helpless he felt, mm. that he, hating himself for not being able to be with me. And he wasn't allowed to, this wasn't like, like the restrictions were that he could not be with me. I was lucky to even be able to be there. Mm. The only people in a hospital who were able to have someone with them were minors at that time. And so he couldn't be with me, he couldn't comfort me, I couldn't comfort him, and it was just this waiting game. And um, they took us to ICU oncology, like the pediatric oncology, and that's when I was like, okay, we said brain tumor, and I'm in the cancer ward. They know more than they're telling me. Um, I know they said it could be cancerous, it might not, they had to run more tests, but it was just suddenly the way everyone was treating me, I was putting together that everyone already knew the prognosis and they just couldn't tell me yet until we had that MRI. And um, and so it took several days for us to get an MRI because it was so backed up because of COVID and all of that stuff. And they told me to call my husband and that they were gonna make an exception we weren't gonna be able to be with her at the same time, but we were gonna be able to meet with the doctors at the same time while they told us the results of the MRI. And so he drove out and um, you know, we went back to that conference room and the doctors came back in to tell us that it was cancerous and that she had a brain tumor called DIPG and that, um, that there's a 0% survival rate. And again, in warrior mom mode, I was like, okay, but what about surgery? Can we operate? And, you know, all those questions that every mom is going to ask, like really not comprehending the 0% survival rate. I could, I could fathom 1%. Like I've heard those stories of kids who defied all odds or didn't, but there was that 1% chance and we're going to like throw the Hail Mary. And here I have them gently trying to tell me like, there is no Hail Mary. Like 
nobody will, you could find the best in the world and they will not touch this. Mm. And the reason being is because this, this type of cancer for anyone who's not familiar, which I had never heard of it, it's basically a tumor attached to the brain stem. So when you look at the picture of the x-ray and the MRI, you know, you have her spinal column, you have her brain, and then you have the tumor is like a lollipop on her, in the center of her brain attached to her spinal column. So there's no way to access it, let alone remove it without 100% killing her in the process or anyone else who has this. And that's what I just wasn't wrapping my brain around. And they were so great about being patient with me and letting me and Ben just kind of process that and ask all those questions even though they had to just keep delivering the same terrible news. And so they gave us um, radiation as an option and steroids and um, told us that, you know, the specialist would come and discuss with us what that would look like. And the next week, to make a long story short, just looked like us meeting with every specialist and um, kind of our village of just amazing friends and their connections pulling out every stop and me getting on the phone with, you know, world-renowned doctors that a friend set up with us, you know, at St. Jude's and just all over the world and all of, and me just saying, just shoot me straight here. Like what, and I said to them, what would you do if this were your kid? Knowing what you know about this type of cancer, what would you do? And, um, and they were honest with me. And I, and they were honest with me because they weren't my doctor. And so I won't say their names because, you know, they said what you can't say in a hospital, what the doctors at Children's wouldn't say to me and it was basically like that treatment is incredibly invasive and is a really crummy quality of life she's pretty her tumor is pretty progressed um you're at the height of a pandemic she will need to go to children you won't be admitted you'll be going back and forth to children's hospital every other day and because she's so young you're gonna have to fully sedate her for radiation like every single time that you go, which is several times a week, which is not healthy for her anyway, and it's no quality of life. Um, and they're like, so it would be really difficult for me to put my toddler through that, knowing what the outcome's gonna be regardless. Um, and that there were no cases of success. And so we decided to take her home. And um, we wanted to do it as quickly as possible. And we decided to the only treatment we were gonna pursue was anything that was gonna make her more comfortable. And we did try the steroids because that was gonna help with the swelling, which was hopefully gonna help improve um, like her level of pain. And she just became, like the side effects of steroids on a toddler were, she wasn't even the same person. Like she was like possessed and miserable, never slept, ravenous in an unhealthy, screaming constantly and just shoving food in her mouth. Like the side effects were horrible. She was going to blow up like a balloon and not be able to move her body. And we were like, fuck this. We're not, no. We might not get a couple more months with her. We might not get a couple more weeks with her. But, you know, one of the blessings for us, if there even was one, is that all I could think in that time is, what if she was seven? What if she wanted to make it to her dance recital? What if she understood that she was dying? And I had to walk in and tell her, you're dying yeah. and we're not gonna do treatment. Like I couldn't have done that if she was seven. I would have, she would have been part of that decision, but she never knew. Like she, I really don't believe that at any point she was like, this is it or panic mode. Like yeah. she was at peace the whole time about yeah. it. It was us who were falling apart. Yeah. Yeah. And again, in hindsight, I can look back and think like, gosh, I can see so clearly that from the moment she entered our life, part of her just super mature, mature soul knew from day one that it was temporary. Like she refused to be potty trained, but she was smart. It, it wasn't like, oh, this is too complicated. It was like, screw it. I don't need, I, I hate reading books. Don't read books to me. I want to be on the move. Like mm -hmm. I will never sit down and read a book with you. I will never be potty trained. And it was like, she didn't need it. Mm -hmm. And I can look back and see all these parts where they're like, I'm going to live to the fullest and I don't need to worry about that. Mom, it's good. I'm good. I don't need to worry about that stuff. And um, so we had, we brought her home to be with the boys and to be with their dogs and to just be home. And we had six more weeks with her. 
and there were beautiful moments where she like returned to us and then there were moments of rapid decline and um, it was beautiful and horrible at the same time and um, we got to have a make a wish for her a COVID version of Make-A-Wish where just amazing humans put together like a petting zoo for her in our backyard because she's obsessed with animals. And she was she was pretty rough at that point. And, and she was so tired and you could tell she was in pain. But you could tell, like you watched her rally for us, for us to be able to celebrate her like one more time and to give her what we weren't gonna be able to give her again. And I just remember her throwing up that morning and having a seizure that morning and knowing that on any other day she just would have slept for the rest of the day. And she just pulled it together and she let me put her hair up. She actually let me touch her hair and she let me put a dress on her. And she went outside and she petted every single animal and she squealed and she like let her brothers see her truly happy for like an hour and a half. And then she just declined pretty rapidly after that. Um, and they did that on um in early May because they did it as her third birthday because we didn't know if she was going to make it to her third birthday she did um May 15th was her third birthday and then on May 27th she passed away at home like in our arms and um and that's a whole different level of you know I did a couple of interviews about a year after and I listen to one in like a moment of doing like some reflective work and trying to like measure some of my healing and where I needed to look at myself a little more closely I re-listened to one of those episodes because I, I I was so in the thick of it at the moment that I did that interview and I remember describing the moment that she passed away and I was like you know it wasn't tr it wasn't tragic or traumatic um it was impossible but it wasn't like this traumatic event. It was the hardest thing we've ever done, but it was so beautiful. And it was. I'm now wise enough to now look back and be like, that was the most traumatic experience ever. But sometimes trauma is beautiful too. Yeah. Yeah. And that's something she taught me. Like mm. the her entire decline down to the moment that she took her final breaths was so beautiful mm. while at the same time being the most traumatic moment of my life. And I thought because it was beautiful, like, oh, I don't have trauma. Like, I did that right. I made sure I did that right, and I did. Like, I fought to do it correctly and to not let my pain, I, I fought to not fall apart until she was gone. Because her final moments, she was not gonna have parents who were falling apart. She was gonna have parents who were giving her a life and her brothers were not gonna witness that at the same time. And, but I can look back now and be like, no, that was entirely traumatic. And I def, I was later diagnosed with like delayed PTSD, took like two and a half years for it to really hit. Um, and, and it hit involuntarily. Like it was, it manifested as migraines and going numb, losing my vision, like the most severe migraines ever and getting every single, like being hospitalized for them and then getting every single test done to find out I was perfectly healthy and having the neurologist sit down with me and say like, have you been through trauma recently? Cause this, we, we see these types of migraines largely in war vets or people who were at like a mass shooting and a couple years later they start to get these bizarre physical symptoms. And so I explained to her, well, this is what we've been through. And she's like, yeah, this is, these headaches are a result of PTSD and your body is telling you like, you need to face this and it was traumatic. And as much as you were so strong, um, it was you just keep telling yourself it was painful, but not traumatic. Just the most impossible pain. But you were so strong that you didn't let it be trauma. Um, and so I think that that's what even four years later now, that's what I'm still navigating is revisiting those, those more impossible moments kind of through um, just new eyes of – where I'm at today and the grief stories that I've heard from other people that have been brought into my life as a result and me just being, you know, that cognitive dissonance, you, it happens to you. So now you see it everywhere and just being really hyper aware of people's pain and trauma now, 
has made me start to go back and and look at what we went through in that moment a lot differently and try to learn the new lessons I'm supposed to learn from it or finish processing what I'm supposed to process. What was beautiful about it? Um, what was beautiful, so she was on hospice and pediatric hospice isn't super common because usually kids are in the hospital for that. So the decision to bring a kid home isn't very common. And when we made that choice and the doctors kept giving us every option of treatment, um, which by the way, I have to say, like as a mom who very openly shares our experience online during this time, um, I've also had the opportunity to talk to many parents who have since Stevie passed away are now navigating the same thing with the same diagnosis with their young child that we went through. And, and I'm, you know, when I know that I can actually be emotionally available to them, it's the first thing I say yes to when I know that I'm, I'm could actually be of help where I'm not, where I'm in a place that it's not going to set me back too far and I can actually be a support. Um, I'll talk with them. And a lot of them have made a very different decision than what I made about as far as treatment. A lot of them pursue treatment. In fact, most people do. And they have my 100% support. Like, I understand every reason they made that choice. If I went back, would I, like, would we have decided on treatment for her? Still no, because that was the right decision for us in that moment and for her. And so that's never me saying, don't pursue treatment. That's me saying, this looks different for all of us. And like, you just have to make the decision that is right for your family. And doctors are incredible. Mm -hmm. And I'm so grateful for them. Mm -hmm. But they aren't going to have to walk in the shoes that you're going to have to walk in or your child. And and they're also very limited in what they can tell you as far as what your options are. Um, they're just there to provide a medical service. And our doctors did it with the utmost compassion and care. But they also didn't get to say, take her home. Right. Like, they were there to pursue treatment right. and to fight it. And they right. were trained to fight. Right. And I just wanted her to live. Yeah. I didn't want her to fight. Yeah. I just wanted her, like, I wanted her to fight if there was hope. Yeah. And um, I knew that a lot of people weren't going to understand our decision. And that that didn't matter. Yeah. But I also knew that rather than become, like, defensive about our decision and F you to the people who didn't understand, I knew this was an opportunity for common ground because – people who didn't understand our decision to not pursue treatment, that was coming from a place of love. Sure. That was coming from a place of not wanting to lose her too. Sure. That was coming from a place of fear sure. from them and a place of doing anything to avoid the pain that was gonna come from this and not wanting to watch her die. Sure. And just like, I mean, I got nasty messages mm -hmm. and, and hate mail on you're killing your child, you're letting mm -hmm. her die, you're giving up on her. You don't. You say that you believe in God. Well, you don't understand the miracles that He can bring. And so I conduct when I like went to tell the public what was going on because I did share our journey along the way. I I had to say to people like, I'm here to deliver worst case scenario, and there's no way to put worst case scenario into words. There just isn't. So I'm just going to tell you what's happening. And you know, I informed them of her prognosis, and then I said. And we've decided to pursue no treatment to bring her home with her family. And I know not a lot of you will understand that decision. Um, and I know a lot of you are grieving this prognosis because you love her just like we do. And I need you to know that we would fight and we would do everything in our power to save her if we thought it could work. But that we're surrendering to this prognosis because we do believe in miracles but miracles do not always come in the way that we want or the way that we hope. Mm -hmm. So that was my way of telling them, like, you can keep praying for miracles, but her living is not going to be this miracle. It's it's going to come in yeah. in the hearts that she restores and right. the connection that she develops in her legacy. That's where these miracles, like, right. the people, the relationships that have been brought into our life. And your boys. Those are the miracles. And and I think that she always knew, like, her purpose was that. Mm -hmm. And the miracles that it was for our marriage. Like, we were, you know, let this, 
because I don't want anyone to, I don't want everyone to have to learn this lesson by losing the thing that's the most sacred to them. So I try to share the lessons that I've learned because totally. it's like, here's the lesson I learned. I really hope you don't have to go through the impossible to like, just listen, just please listen. And we were those parents that it, we still are and we have to fight. We were the parents who loved each other so much, but we were coexisting yeah. and we were becoming less and less connected every single day. Right. And we were never going to, we were never going to separate. We were never going to divorce. We were always going to love each other, but we were just surviving and, you know, driving kids here and driving kids there and navigating this and both consumed with work and all of the things. And, um, and when she passed away, I looked at Ben and I said, like, I cannot lose you too. We lost her. I cannot lose you. Like, I, you need to stay with me because she sacrificed herself for us. Like literally, she sacrificed herself so that we will start living. Mm -hmm. Our life was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Like it, it checked all the boxes technically, but we were not living. We were surviving. We were just going through the motions of like getting through each day of having young kids and um, bills and all of the stuff sure. and a way overpacked schedule. Sure. And, and we weren't living and we weren't taking deep breaths. And I just said to him like, this is this is part of her sacrifice was for you and I to not to, to not just coexist Did anymore. Did you know that instantly? Yeah, like that was I, knew it, I knew it. I knew it before she passed away. Yeah. Um, like a big part of our story is, you know, Ben was part of why I fell in love with Ben was he was raised very differently than than I was. You know a little bit of his backstory, and he was raised in a you know very religious family, very close family, a large family. He's the middle of five kids, um, parents who were stayed together, church every single Sunday, never had a drop of alcohol in his life, never had a girlfriend until me, like just a very, like just this idyllic, I always compare it to Full House, even though they were so dysfunctional, but just <laughs> like this, like at the end of the day, dad sits on the edge of your bed and pats yeah. you on the back. And and it was so like beautiful to me because when I met him and saw just like his innocence and his purity, but also his complete willingness to step into anyone else's pain and go there with him. He might not be able to relate, but he was going to get in that trench with you. For sure. And he saw the broken and the hurting. And... It's probably why he saw me, whereas I had a very different upbringing and I never had to doubt whether I was loved. I was so loved and adored and taken care of growing up, but there was so much dysfunction. And then I was an only child, an atheist on top of it. Like it was literally a polar opposite upbringing um, from him. And so when I met him that first time, I think that's a big part of what I was drawn to was like, that's how I want to raise my kids. Mm -hmm. But with the balance of like reality of I want you to have this idyllic life, but I'm also gonna teach you about how unrealistic this is. This gift that we're giving you is not what the rest of the world is getting and you're gonna have to you know, have compassion for that and be the change, right? That was just kind of my very young, idyllic fall in love with him and this is the future we're gonna build and I'm gonna do it differently and I'm gonna break those generational curses and I'm gonna marry the dad that I never had, you know, mm -hmm. my absent dad, I'm going to marry the guy who was going to be the perfect dad and the supportive husband and, you know, just what was missing from my life. And so any time in our marriage and his parents that something hard happened, it was really tough for him. Mm -hmm. And no one was more willing to face it head on because nobody was full of more love than that guy. Totally. Like no one. But he did not have... um like there was no scar tissue there, yeah. you know? Yeah. So it was, it was like a fatal blow almost every single time. And me coming over and thanking him for being so willing to take the fatal blow, but having to pick him up yep. and be like, okay, ready? We're like, we're still in this, like the fight is not over. And um, when we got the news about Stevie, like after that meeting, I thought like there was a period of time where I thought I lost him. Like I didn't know if he could come back from that. And he shut down. And it was like the more he shut down, the more I buried my own pain, fully aware that I was doing it. This wasn't like a denial, like, oh, it, this, this, shit away. Like, this was yeah. like, this is not the time. Yeah. You will not break right now. Yeah. You will show up and you will be, pr not only, you're not going through the motions, you will show up and you will be fucking present yeah. Yeah. for every moment of yeah. this. Yeah. Um, 
because that's going to save you guys later. And um, the problem is, is though the reality of marriage, gosh, doesn't that sound great? Like, how strong are you, Ash? Your husband's falling apart and you just held it all together. And that was true on some days, but then I started to resent him because I was pissed. I was like, his anger about what was happening, he just shut down. That's Ben's form of anger. Like Ben doesn't express a traditional anger. His form of anger is he just goes inward and shuts down and disassociates. And that's like the cruelest thing you could do to me. Miss, let's talk about our feelings all the time, right? <laughs> like I like we're going to get in it. Yeah. You're feeling something slightly. Let's talk about it for three hours and just really, how does that relate to your childhood? Um, <laughs> and so when we were experiencing the most impossible thing and he just shut down, I started to get mad and I started to like what started at first as me just being patient and gently coaxing him out turned into me being like, hey, I need you to pull this together, not for me, but for them. Mm -hmm. Like we don't know how much time we have left with her. You're doing all the physical stuff right, but you are not, you're gonna regret that. And our boys, they need to see you not as a shell of a human. Like you need to come back to us. And he wasn't getting what I was saying. And um, we had like this breakthrough rock bottom breakdown moment where like he was in our bathroom and I just like walked in there and shut the door because at this point like our house is chaos and like there's people trying to help everywhere and nurses and I don't want the boys to hear us and I just like shut the door and Ben and I communicate very differently like I'm very direct and he's you know he's more of like tell it to me in a metaphor and then I'm going to understand it because telling him something direct makes him shut down a little bit. Makes him like, that's too much. So at first I was telling him very direct how I need you to be here. Like I need you to come back. And he was, it was just, I was watching him pull away more and more and more. And I took a pause and I was like, wait, Ash, that's the way you need to be talked to. That's not the way he needs to. And you know that. So I pulled back and I just said to him like, okay, we're on a boat. <laughs> right we're all on a boat yeah and our whole family is on a boat and we are hitting some turbulent waters and now it's a full-blown storm yeah. and we you keep getting bucked off this boat into the water and I'm just trying to keep our family on the boat like I just don't want us to drown right and you keep getting bucked off and I keep setting our kids aside and I'm jumping in the water and I'm pulling you back to us and we get on the boat and I give you CPR and revive you and then I hold our family again and then you get bucked off. I've been able to do that in the past with minor, with the more minor things we've navigated, but I can't do that with this. I can't because I can't leave them behind anymore. I cannot risk them falling in while I go get you and I'm not strong enough anymore. I can't swim back and forth anymore. Like I am barely hanging on and I don't need you to be happy. I don't need you to be the strongest person in this family. I just need you to stay on the boat. I need you to be willing to stay here with us, like willing to fight to stay on the boat because I'm not going to keep jumping in. I'm not. I'll never leave you. We'll be together forever. I will love you forever because I know exactly why you're falling in. I want to fall in too. But, and, if, and if it weren't for our boys, if it weren't for our boys, I promise you, we would have sunk to the bottom of that ocean and been pretty happy with it, honestly. Like just been pretty at peace there. And I just looked at him and I said, I'm gonna stay with them. And I don't, I don't wanna do that. Like I want you here with us yeah. and I really don't want them watching you just drift off into the distance. That will kill them. It will kill them to watch, to lose you too. And it will kill me, but I'll do it and I'll go through the motions and I'll never leave your side, but I can't jump in anymore at their expense. And it, I just saw this like light bulb moment for him wow. of like, and he was like, I'll get on the boat. Fuck yeah. I'll get on the boat. Like, I get it. Okay. And from that moment on, this was, we'd only been home with her for about a week. So like, it felt like forever, but I don't sit with resentment for very long because it just eats away at me. I'm like, like I said, an over communicator. So I would say about a week of me letting him fester and just, this is natural stages of grief. And then I was like, we don't have much time. I got, we got to do this now. And so from that moment on, like we had our moments, but he was incredibly present and we were partners through the whole thing of just like, this is going to look the way we want it to look. Like this, 
we're going to give her the last final days as much as we can mm. as what we want. And so I went back to hospice. Mm. Um, there wasn't, there wasn't like a lot of pediatric hospice options at this time. And so dear friends of ours who were work in the industry, they were like, Hey, they don't do peds, but these, these specific nurses that work there are the perfect fit for your family. And this is who we want you working with. So we started working with them and these nurses would come over and the last thing you want in your house ever really <laughs> for like periods of time is a stranger, Yeah. let alone while your daughter's dying and your family's falling apart is like a stranger telling you what to do or just being this presence. And I was just like, you have got to be kidding me. Like, I don't want to have to be on. I don't want to have to ask if they want water while I'm falling apart. Uh, well, <laughs> these two superhuman nurses changed everything for us because it was like this immediate connection. I still like, I still have relationships with them. And, you know, one of them has a Stevie tattoo now and they just mm -hmm. became a part of our life. But um, they taught us like what to do and how to do it right. And And they said like, this is, part of why I'm so open is because of what they taught us and that, you know, they said most families that they go be with them while their loved one is dying, like just aren't willing to do that. They're in so much pain that they're, they're so wrapped up in their own like grief and what's about to happen that they later have a lot of regret that they didn't, you know, that they weren't present for those final moments. And like, we were just by the grace of God in a position to receive the advice they were giving us about how to navigate this and we took it and that's why it was beautiful. Like when we knew it was time, one of our nurses, Barb, she was like, I want you to just light candles everywhere. We're getting rid of all of the, ho I don't want this to look like a hospital room. All that hospital equipment, get it out of here. I don't want it in your vision. I don't want you to see it. What are songs that are meaningful to you? Let's get those playing. Just tell, like, get that she can't see much right now, so let's light the candles and tell her over and over that you love her and that she can go to the light. Like, they just really walked us through that. They helped us be aware of, like, just the presence of spirit that was in that room in that moment. It was, it was so, like, you could feel it. God was in our house. In our house. Like, thick as... You can imagine, you could feel it. And the people who were, like a lot of the people who were closest to us would come, came over to say goodbye. And they would just, like they, we still all talk about this day, I get the chills. And they walked in and it was like, it was almost like walking into heaven a little bit. And that, like, I won't, oh, I won't ever feel that again in this life. Like I just won't. Very few people ever will. And, um... And what it what breaks my heart for so many grieving people is like we all have access to feel that when we're losing someone we love. It's there. When anyone's passing away, it is there. But we get in the way. Totally. Our pain and our fear gets in the way of us being able to access that. And we were in a headspace and surrounded by enough people that were able to keep us there in that headspace. And I was also really protective of our space and keeping it sacred and who we let in. And, um, you know, there were a lot of moments where I recognized I wasn't the only one grieving and her grandparents were grieving and her great grandparents and her aunts and uncles and her cousins and our best friends were all grieving immensely. And it wasn't just me. And here they were in the midst of their own, for a lot of them, the biggest loss they would ever experience in their life. But shaming themselves because they were comparing it to mine and Ben's loss. Well, this isn't what they're going through. So it was almost like I was surrounded by all these people who wouldn't let themselves feel their own pain because they felt guilty being sad. They felt guilty being broken because, well, I don't have to feel the way Ben and I can't even imagine how Ben and Ashley are feeling. So what right do I have to be, have to be completely broken about this, right? And so like that was her nanny who was like a sister to me and just part of our family who was isolating with us during COVID because we had been together when we got the news. So anyway, this was, this was a lot of people, grandparents. And, um, and so tension would start to rise and you would, I would start to hear like my friends and family kind of snap at each other over little stupid shit. Right. And, and some members of my family feel like the other members weren't being sensitive and, and maybe they weren't like they weren't wrong. 
And I remember just like kind of calling everyone together and saying, we're gonna, we're gonna say a prayer now. Because I knew that if I just talked to them, like a lecture, no one was gonna listen. So I just did it in the form of a prayer. And like, we all just bowed our heads. And I just was like, like, Heavenly Father, please, please help us all to have clarity about the fact that every one of us is grieving right now. And every single one of us is in the most pain we've ever experienced. And every one of us is terrified. And, um, and when we're scared, we don't always act like ourselves. And that the, per the people that we're frustrated with are at their worst right now, are at their rock bottom. And so, and so are you. So let's find where we connect. Let's find where we're the same in this. Let's find where we're all like, oh, you're behaving that way because you are grieving the same thing I'm grieving, the same person I'm grieving, the same feelings. And let's focus on that as opposed to the fact that they were being insensitive about yeah. if you should be invited to this or if you should yeah. get a these front row seat to that. These, yeah, covers, it was just yeah. it was just this moment of like, for Stevie, we are gonna put our own grief aside and you will feel so much better if you just take the person sitting next to you's grief into account instead of your own for a minute. You will be able to see your own and access it with so much more clarity if you just take the perspective of the person sitting next to you. How, how often do you do that in your life? You say for, for like, like, like to this day, like how often do you say for Stevie, I'm going to do this for Stevie? Like how, how often is that motivational and guiding? And, and like, is it constant? Is it is it there every single second? Yeah. And it's um, just become... It's, it's everything. I think that, um, you know, when you, obviously as a parent, you know, because I know it's true for Ben too, but something I've learned that especially as a mom who physically grew her, there's this physical thing that happened to me after, that you always feel as a mom, but losing her helped me like, not just feel it, like see it, realize it, understand it, of, um, oh, she's literally part of me. And she's not here, but she is literally part of me. And I struggle with being able to access her. Like that's the hardest part of grief is wanting so desperately to be able to access her and not be able to or not feel like I am. Um, and obviously I would love to be able to access her physically, but I just mean like on a spiritual level, um, I struggle with that. And so it's reminding myself that like she is literally DNA a part of me. And um, – and so her legacy and purpose, because I can't bear the thought of it just being over, like it is in everything I do, everything. Because what she taught me and my experience with her is in everything I do because it's completely changed me as a person. Like I am a completely different person because of her. So as a result, everything after Stevie is different. It's all yeah. laced with her. Yeah. Every bit of it is influenced by her, yeah. every moment. You know, and ultimately, it, 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 you know, the perspective, it, it really hit me what you said. And I see so much about the way you live. And I want to talk about more about, you know, service and the decisions you make mm -hmm. and how you live your life. But 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 to, to be able to spread, you know, these lessons that you've you've learned. But, you, you know, you don't want folks to have to have been through what you've been through. Um is beautiful and and uh, just like says such volumes about who you are and this, your how enlightened you are and, and graceful you are and your family is. Um, There's a flip side to that too, though, of you know the lessons that we learned as a result of the trauma that you know you wouldn't wish on anyone, but then there's also the lessons we've learned that are inevitable for every single one of us, and. I think that my, like, I still haven't wrapped my brain around what it looks like, you know, my my purpose in this pain. You know, I get glimpses here and there, but but I don't know fully what that's going to look like other than I come back to the message all the time of, like, the language of grief and how just as a people, we don't know how to speak it. Mm. We We've for so many years and so many generations, um, we, there's a stigma around it and you don't talk about it and we don't talk about the people we lost or you grieve in private. Why do we grieve in private? Like, I know it's a deeply personal thing, 
like, but every single one of us is going to experience love and loss in this life, guaranteed, yeah. no matter where you're from, what your background is, what your circumstance is. And so I always say that like, grief has the power to unify us. It is, sure. it is the one thing we all have in common. For sure. Like we can find all the reasons that we're divided, but grief is what sure. we have in common. So why aren't we learning how to talk about it? Why do we have shame and stigma around it when it can be a bridge for so many things? Because so many decisions or so much fear that we live in is coming from what we're afraid to lose. Mm. And if we would just be more willing to talk about what we're afraid to lose, vulnerably, we would understand each other so much better because I think that our capacity to listen would increase. I think we would get so much better at listening if we were willing to talk about our own vulnerability like a lot more. And those are the two things missing for connection. And so the problem with grief is that we all do it differently and there isn't a right or wrong way. And um, for me, the approach I've taken is purpose in the pain. And I feel like a hundred percent certain and committed to that. And I don't like, I do not say, I think that everything happens for a reason. And I do not mean it in that cheesy, like, oh, well, that's so great. This all happened for a reason. I mean, if it happened and it sucked, you better believe I'm going to use it to make something better out of the shitty situation. Like I'm going to use it. Or, or why did it happen? Like what a disservice to her, this is my personal opinion, that if I just let this continue on throughout our family as this tragedy that happened and nothing more, as opposed to this tragedy that became a miracle for so many people or for ourselves. And whether it's a tiny miracle, like I get, I'll get messages from people just saying like, I mothered differently just because of your experience. Like my patience level this summer having my kids home. And that's a, that's a tiny thing that is going to have generational impact. Yeah. Just patience yeah. with our kids or perspective or just a tiny bit of more gratitude or appreciation for the small moments that we maybe take for granted that we're all guilty of because yeah. life is hard and exhausting. Um, to me, those are miracles. And those are the purpose in the pain that I felt and continue to feel. That's the purpose behind it. And again, because I've been through this, now I'm people who have grieved or people who have lost, lost children are all around me now and like front row and they don't all share that perspective. And I would never force that on them. Mm -hmm. I would, And I would never ever for a second judge the way that they're choosing to grieve or the perspective that they're choosing to have. It might not fit for me and how I'm going to be able to wake up and continue on through this life and how I'm going to be able to keep showing up. I, I wouldn't be able to keep showing up without the perspective that I have. Um, but we all get to choose how we grieve or we all just get to let grief happen to us in our own way. Cause I don't, there's not a lot of choice in grief, but we let it happen to us in certain ways and we don't all do that the same. And we are so quick to judge the way the others grieve. And I, I know I've been judged and I know that prior to going through my own grief, I, I'm sure that I judged others or had opinions on what they did. You know, she well, passed away. Go ahead. No, 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 you, you. Well, I was just going to say that when she passed away, we didn't get to have a funeral because it was COVID. And we were only allowed to have nine immediate family members outdoors at her burial. Wow. And I remember thinking like, just another freaking tragedy of this whole thing. Like, are you kidding me? Now I can't even like honor her death. I can say now that that was the biggest blessing to ever happen to us. Hmm ever because um, Ben and I, who maybe would have had a tendency to make that day about other people, we just got to be with our boys and we just got to be with her. And it, it didn't matter. We didn't have thousands of people watching us cry. Like we got to fall apart. If we, we got to walk barefoot next to Like we just got to be there and not have it be a production. We didn't have to produce anything. I didn't have to go get pictures of her blown up and make sure we had enough flat. Like, I didn't have to do any of that that I would have had to do. And it felt like um, it felt like a loss at that time. And I can look back now and see like, gosh, that was a really beautiful day because that decision was just made for us. It was just made for us that we had to say goodbye to her in that way. Um, 
does that allow you to sort of like trim fat out of like other aspects of your life and avoid like fanfare and bullshit like and, 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 and cut two things? The grief just gave clarity, like unbelievable clarity. I remember they sat down and we had to pick out a freaking casket. Like they, here's a catalog of these little tiny miniature caskets and I'm going through and they're all glossy and ornate. And again, so many families choose that mm -hmm. and that's beautiful and that's mm -hmm. their personal. Mm -hmm. And I looked and mm -hmm. I was like, and I called up my friend and he cut a tree down from his property and she got the most simple pine box and we went over to his house and we painted, we put paint on our hands and we put our handprints on her tiny pine box and then she gets to become one with the earth. And that's because just in that moment, that simplicity felt right for mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. It just, mm -hmm. it felt right. And it mm -hmm. was, it was just simple, mm -hmm. you know? And um, that's what I was saying is those were our choices. Mm -hmm. And I fully respect that everyone gets to make their own choice, but that's part of the disconnect in this language of grief is like, okay, I want everyone to learn the language, but we have to understand that we're all speaking incredibly different dialects. So you have to be patient and you can't be judgmental and you can't, expect someone else to grieve the way you grieve. And we had that day with her where we buried her and it wasn't necessarily a funeral and it wasn't this big memorial service. And so we we had a dear friend of ours who was a photographer come and just like capture those raw moments of her like her brother saying goodbye to her and us just what that was like. And um, boy, did we get judged for that boy, were we misunderstood in that. And and I'm not surprised. Like, I could easily see, you know, like, oh, so you're doing this for social media. Oh, you're, cap you're you know, capitalizing on your most vulnerable moments. And I can see that narrative. I can see. But that's what my hope is. Like, why is that the first place we go? Like, why is that the first assumption as opposed to they had a reason for that decision? And they know that, they weren't going to maybe be physically and emotionally present that day and that their healing was going to involve needing to go back there and they didn't want to bury it. They didn't want to forget what that felt like to bury the most important thing to them. They like that pain was a symbol of their love and they're going to want to look back on that sometimes. And their boys who are going to get older who right now aren't equipped and 100% like at the age they were at disassociate I mean they were emotional wrecks that day but do I think they remember one single detail no do I know that when they get older and they have children of their own they're gonna need that they're gonna need to make connection between what was really a memory and what am I creating and what was that day like we're all gonna need it you know and that's what that was for us um and so when I see somebody grieving in a way that I'm like gosh that feels bizarre or that feels insensitive or that feels attention seeking um I instead try to look at it more as like what what hole are they needing to fill not in a, not in a negative way but literally yeah like how is this part of their healing process and if there's like one time where we can just have grace and just let people do it the way they need to do it why do you think that is that people have that I mean I've never thought look why, why uh, 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 that, that, that people jump to these kinds of conclusions and, and get judgmental in, in moments like this? I is mean, it fear? Is it... I think we live in a really cynical For sure. time and, For sure. and social media. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. And um, the last generation has really been the birth of vulnerability. And that's terrifying. And so we're living in this weird time where we have, you know, previous generations who are dedicated to shaming any form of vulnerability and are wildly uncomfortable with it. And then we have the super young generations who are oversharers. For sure. And, um, and nothing is personal and nothing is sacred. And so much we, you know, there's so much positive reinforcement for oversharing something even before maybe you've processed it or dealt with it yourself, which is unhealthy. So we have like these two extremes. And then we have like our generation in the middle trying to, educate the older generation and teach the younger. Yep. And and it's just, it's a weird time. Yeah. And we don't ever have time to process that immediate thought. So our immediate thought is judgment. And because it's social media, we just express our immediate thought. We don't have time to have that first thought of judgment, step back, perspective take, think about it, and then reapproach. Like we're just training ourselves to just say the first thing out of our minds. And... um 
that language of grief, like that's not part of that. Yeah. Like this, this takes effort and it takes immense willingness because you have to be willing to step into another person's pain. You have to be willing to perspective take. You have to be willing to be wrong or you have to be willing to think differently and love and support that person even if you don't agree. Like even especially when you don't agree. And um, and grace. grace. Like the number one part of the language of grief is grace because the, the grieving person um, will not be who they used to be and they'll hate themselves for it. They'll, they imagine just waking up one day and absolutely not recognizing the person you're looking at. And I like who I am better because of the clarity and I'm not hustling for like, my motivations behind things are, I can clearly see where they were a lot more ego driven or validation driven that I was very much raised in a culture of like, you, you do certain things to receive that validation. And then I brought that into like my early years of marriage and my early years of my career. Like all of these altruistic things I was doing or the things I was writing about to get a sense of connection were really for validation yeah, for me. Yeah, yeah. You know, and yeah. I and I look there was a period of time where I looked back on that and I was like, I can never admit that out loud. Yeah. Like, what a fraud. Yeah. What a scam. Like how selfish, how self absorbed. Yeah. Like, how many likes did you get? How many comments did that get? And I can see that version of myself, you know, when I was in my mid and late twenties, when I was first starting out in like blogging and social media world. Yeah. That it was very misguided. Yeah. Um, but I was young. Sure. And inexperienced, and and life hadn't really happened to me yet. Fuck but I thought, if, if, if that's like the, the 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 scope of the things that you regret in your twenties, holy shit, man! I mean, if that's like your big, you know, what um, I mean, we all have our list of regrets. Yeah, like, but that, like that, I think is, I think so many of us hold on to that, like the shame that comes around doing things for the wrong reasons, but projecting to the world that you're doing it for a different reason. Totally, totally. I think that the shame is so strong there that a lot of us choose not to overcome it. So even when we want to. So we walk around continuing to do things. It's this vicious cycle of we keep doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. For sure, for sure. And um, the lessons life dealt me pulled me right down to like humility, <laughs> rock yeah, yeah. bottom, yeah, like yeah. really quick. Yeah. And also the people in my life. Like I've been really selective and really great at the friends around me and how authentic they were and them loving me at my worst helped give me a lot of permission and courage to just like show up as myself and not need to come across a certain way in order to be like enough, you know? And yeah. and that takes every that takes work every day. Yeah. Like everyone's worst fear is to be misunderstood, right? Sure. So you try to show up as you want people to see you. Um and so, you know, that takes constant effort, but it that's one of the gifts of grief is it kind of just makes you be like that mattered to me? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. are you kidding? Yeah. So many people would say, like, when Stevie got sick and I was writing about it, and it went viral. Like, it it was getting, I mean, I wasn't really aware of it at the time. Like, I was hearing about it, but it just, I wasn't processing. I'm like, yeah, that's great. Okay, good. Cool. The blessings I was seeing in it was like, now I'm getting a call from this doctor because they heard about her story and like, oh, I can get more information. Mm. Or look how much quicker... Make a wish happened because they saw it on social media, and yeah. even though it's COVID, the florist is showing up for free, and the balloon person, like all of these people, just you know, celebrities showing up to send her a message, like these just beautiful little miracles that came as a result. Like I was able to recognize and appreciate that, and acknowledge that there's so few people's experience, and that we were really blessed yeah. with those bits of light, mostly for our boys, sure. because they needed that. Sure. Um, you know, we have Aaron Rodgers show up on our doorstep, mask free, hugging our kids, just like, whatever, give me COVID, like your boys need hugs. Mm. And just like being in our house. And mm. the day we buried her, no, like being like, I want to be respectful of your personal space, but if it would help if I was there, would your boys like to see me today? Mm. And we were just like, yeah, they're mm. too young. They, they cannot sit. They've buried their sister today. They, we, we're not going to hold vigil of depression. Like now we're going to celebrate. You know, so we, a lot of those really beautiful, amazing things happened. Um, and I'm just so aware at how few people's grief experiences that is, is 
shared by a whole community yeah. or a village and that a lot of people do this alone. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. And, um, you know, there've been so many times when I've isolated but I've had a village there to make sure that I didn't disappear yeah, yeah, yeah. and that a lot of people disappear into this. And I can't pretend to fully understand that because that wasn't our experience. Like we very much had a village and a community. And even when they weren't around us, I, we felt it. Even when it was silent, I could feel the people around the world, like rooting for her, praying for us. I still do today. Like it was palpable. Like, and that is, not a lot of people's experience. And um, the only chance they have of just being able to see light again is if more of us try to understand what they're going through. Sure. You sure, know, more sure. of us try to be willing to go into their darkness, not just observe it. Sure. We love to observe people going through really difficult things. Like the amount of people who started following our journey that we just call like trauma chasers sure, because sure. it's just a really exciting thing to them. And were they supportive? Yes. Yeah. But as soon as the trauma, like as soon as the healing started, did they bounce? Yes. Yeah. So we take them out of the equation, but the people who were just really willing to go there when they didn't have to, sure, just to put themselves in that situation, that's the language of grief. Yeah. Yeah. Willing to feel an ounce of your pain yeah, with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, totally. M does in fact make it lighter. And not just to the people in the public eye, not just to the people on social media, but like your neighbor. And also grief isn't just losing a child or a spouse. Right, like, it's such an opportunity for con for connection and cohesion. Yes. And, and it, like you said, it's the one thing that we all definitely... Yeah. And and and, it, and what it, what is that? Is that like the, the sort of kernel of the motivation... For the for for social media, like what what for social media now? On just being totally honest, I mean it's it's my job and it puts food on the table. So there's this fine balance between um, showing up with an impact I hope to have or influence I hope to have. And when I say influence, like not because I'm any sort of expert in anything. I mean because I hope that just like our vulnerability and willingness to share. Number one, makes people feel less alone. And I think when you feel less alone, um, you're more open to growth and healing. And, and I know that that is her legacy, is just wanting people to be willing to heal. You, you will never heal from whatever is painful for you, whether it's divorce, childhood trauma, bullying, illness, loss, grieving the life you imagine for yourself maybe you have a great life but it wasn't what you imagine like that's grief you have your kids and you freaking love the heck out of them and they're amazing and you think they're amazing and you would do anything for them but maybe they're not the kids you always imagined you were going to have when mm -hmm. you were growing up mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, we have so much shame saying we grieve that mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you're not proud of your kids that doesn't mean you don't love them mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you aren't grateful for them mm -hmm. but like that's a real thing. Like I, we, Ben and I went through that and we went through it silently because we were both so ashamed that we didn't have exactly the family we imagined when we were in our early 20s mm. and that it was harder than we thought or yeah, that we were yeah. having to take a different route or that, you know, it wasn't going to pan out the way we thought. And eventually, like with clarity and maturity and therapy, we were able to just be okay grieving the life we imagined and know that that didn't mean we weren't grateful for our life and that we didn't love it any less, but that that's grief too. And so um, that's kind of the underlying message is just the balance between, hey, everyone, I'm not going to hide that this provides for my family and that I have sponsor content and that I did this long before Stevie got sick. Like I've been doing this for a long time and like I'm a grandmother and so you have all of the TikTokers now. I'm not on TikTok really, but you have this whole different generation of the word I hate influencers so much. Um, and I am definitely considered a grandmother in that area. Like <laughs> one of the OGs when it was yeah. blog spot yeah. and I'm looking at all these youngins out there yeah, and yeah, I'm, yeah. and Ash, I mean, this is something I know so fucking little I about, know, but like when I know. you came to the, you know, we were at that basketball tournament. I think it was like some Oh hi moms. Like they started like shrieking when they saw you. Well, They're you're like, like Oh, oh here God. they come to get an autograph from the Punisher. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> what, 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 what can I do for you guys? You want a selfie? You want me to take it? Like, Who the fuck are you at? So was... like, Holy shit. I was like, wow. It's like that. That's fucking. <laughs> No, that was funny. That I remember that moment because I also remember that was 
that was sort of the birth of, um, you know, me opening up to you and also to your wife, who I just feel this very different special connection to that I hope she shares. We haven't really talked about it. Like, we've gone deep without going deep um, because she reminds me a lot of Ben. Hmm. Like Dude, Aaron when reminds, you were saying that about Ben, I was like, I know what that's she like. She reminds me so much of Ben, and like for whatever reason, I'm attracted to that personality. Like I'm yeah, like yeah. a magnet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and I just think that like they're the yin to my yang, totally. perhaps. Totally. And like the balance, and sometimes I can be like a whisperer to that type of personality totally. type, where it's like, hey, you're on guard. You're yeah. protecting your feelings. You're protecting your pain. I'm going to get you a fucking loudspeaker for that whisper. I mean, I wish. I wish I had. That's, I wish I could do that. More so, it's like, I'm just going to create a safe space for you to do that here. And maybe you'll never feel comfortable talking about it, but maybe you'll feel comfortable letting me be your voice. I I think, I think that, uh, you you know, like the one thing about me, Aaron and I too, like, you you, you know, shit, man, 25, you know, I met her in 1999, you know, like we've been together for a long time. And the one thing that we've always been the exact same on is that when there's people that we like immediately love, we're like, they're righteous. We like, we want more, you know, like we both had that reaction to you and, and to Ben and the boys like immediately. And, and, um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, that was one of the things is, 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 you know, when you talk about being on, on that boat, you know, that, that, you know, with, with, with us and our family, you know, when Addie got sick, I mean, it's like, yeah, the dynamics of our family, two boys and a little girl and into what I perceived as like an enormously thoroughly felt <clears throat> just crazy healthy way. You got, you guys were just super kind of open about what you know kind of what had gone on with you guys and and i had never i don't know i i I think for us because you know addy made it through and because you know all these doctors were saying she wasn't and and um you know we were on that that boat for a little bit you walked it yeah a little bit and 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 it's a and you know whether it's easier harder whatever it, it you know like to, to talk about it, it was always something, you know, that, it, you, you know, what, what I know is that, you know, Aaron as a, as a, as a nurse and, 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 and what it's always been for, for me, like her perspective, like, yeah, man, like she grew up, she grew up pretty hard and she fucking, you know, like keeps it in and she, you know, not like, you know, she's not like a blubbering fucking like actor, you know I mean? She's like tough as fuck, yeah. you know, but like, you know, those days, you know, when Addie was, in the hospital, you know, in a coma, not, t- you know, like, you know, I couldn't hold it together. And I would just go in and see her by her side. And it was just, it, you know, and, and when you, you talk about sort of the beauty in that, like I saw the beauty, I was like, that's the, mo- that power, like she, they're just like there. That's an, she, like my wife never looked more beautiful to me than, than those days. Like, ne- you know, like she was just like, so be- like she had, I knew she wasn't sleeping. I knew she was, she was just beautiful. And they were just, she was right. There, and there was never any, it was just, she was going to be right there, you know? Um, never wavered. Zero. And no, like, and you know me, like I want to hit somebody. I want to like, hurt somebody, you know, and like, and it, and you it want does to do it's, something. I want to do something, you know? And, and, uh, what was I, different between you two after that? I think it was kind of so, sort of what you were saying. It's like, it was another, I mean, I think, I think one of the real great, beautiful things about being with somebody for a really long time and growing up yeah. with somebody. Yeah. I, th- I think what's hard about it is that people do get older and they change and they, and they literally like, I am, you know, when Aaron met me, yeah. you know, I was like bouncing in a bar and um, drunk every night. And and I'm like, still trying to figure out Aaron being attracted to that <laughs> version insane. of you, if I'm well, being if you honest. Knew her fam- I mean, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. It's, it's really yeah. crazy. And 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 like, you know, re- really was like a, a fucking, It was familiar, though, to her. I like, think it, it was familiar. She wasn't scared of it. I definitely wasn't scared yeah, of it. it was and, like, it, yeah. And you were you at your core. I, th- I think so. And, yeah. and, and, and I think, uh, 
you, you know, I think I, th I think she she dug that I was an artist, and she yeah. really like the fact that she was attracted to that yeah. side of me, and that would come to these like little shitty fucking plays, yeah. like 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 the you, you know like it was not supposed to work out. Yeah. Like, yeah, like yeah. what are you doing? You know, like I, I was like literally like dancing around on stage with like six people in the audience there she was like beaming you know yeah. like, and she was like you were really good I'm like that was good but like uh <laughs> remember what this is like all about in the first place about yeah. those true colors about what you like it genuinely not just like our our you know dig about each other but what, yeah. what you inherently like love and like the fact that you know like when you said before you, you know when you were separated from Ben, it was like, you know, when, when Aaron and I weren't together, it was like, it was the last thing I thought about yep. before I went to bed. The first thing I woke up, like, I, I literally cannot be on this planet without yeah. her. I can't, you know, like, and, and, uh, and, and, and we were so fucking different, but we compliment each other. Like, like, I just like, I don't know what she needs out of me. I, I genuinely don't know, but I know what I need. And like, you know, seeing her in that hospital is like, yeah, that's, that's you know being strong that way and, and yeah. being be, be, you know that that's like so uh i don't know if she ever told you because like it wasn't lost on me like there was a moment and of course it was in like a a basketball gym with chaos and kids falling apart and strangers and noise and like we had this moment that was really like an hour um she just asked me a little bit about stevie in in Aaron's way of like, oh, I don't ever want to overstep, you know, like I'm going to be really sensitive and how that turned into me asking about Addie and how for whatever reason, you know, she just, we had a moment and she opened up and she just like went into it. And I, and I never like, not for the whole time it was happening and ever since, like there was never a moment where I took for granted that that wasn't something that that she always, that she does regularly. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I share our story, like, when I can. I'm comfortable talking about her. It doesn't mean it's easy. And I have to, like, know and trust the intentions of the person I'm sharing with. But, like, I knew that that was a rare moment for her. And, and I wasn't asking easy questions. Maybe wasn't even asking questions she had ever been asked before, mm -hmm. you know. And, um, and she was just, like, so honest in that moment and so that's why when you're describing her in that moment I can like see it because I remember her sharing that experience with me and that's what I saw like I fell in love with her when she was telling me mm -hmm. and she is the least like self I mean she doesn't even know how great she is mm -hmm. do you know what I mean totally. so she's not telling that story to be like and mm -hmm. then I did this and John was out of town and I did it was like just so much humility and all I could think is just like you are a freaking like you Ugh. yeah and um and just again like it was such a moment of connection for us right and was the outcome the same no but like we we walked the same everything in those moments and hearing her share it and then me saying to her like hey I hope you know that even because your outcome looks very different and because she's here today and she's beautiful and she's healthy and she's fine and she overcame and and like nobody would ever know that that was a part of Addie's story, right? Or a part of your story unless they knew. They wouldn't know how close it was to mm -hmm. being very different. I said, I hope you know that even though that was your outcome, like there is still so much grief in what you went through. And there is still so much to revisit about those moments that you survived and lived and the decisions you had to make and the moments you weren't sure what was going to happen. Um, like that is living in both of you, mm. you know? Mm. And when she goes into just like putting Addie in bed with her because she was sick and just being there when the seizure starts. And what if she wasn't? Totally. You know, and but like that moment of she's home alone and this is happening and she knows exactly what she needs to do. And she, and I know that feeling like as a mom, I know that moment of like, I'm just going to go into the mode of I'm going to do exactly what my kid needs me to do right now. And nothing else is on the table. Um, when you come down from that, like you're a badass, number one, but your body is like, I mean, that is like a 
a train wreck. That is yeah. like getting in a car accident. Yeah. That is like yeah. surviving a terminal illness. It, yeah. And we we don't realize that. So we wonder why we're getting sick or we wonder why yeah. Yeah. we're having headaches or why we have anxiety now. Yeah. And that is also part of the language of grief. Yeah. That's what we don't talk about are what are these more long-term effects that go unspoken that we're attributing to things that are really related to that trauma and that grief that we endured um, that we're like, oh, but I, but I came out of it on the other side or so many good things came from it. I should be fine or enough time has passed. Yeah. That's the biggest load of crap in the whole world. How so? Like, yeah. like time does not heal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And maybe it does yeah. for some people. I'm yeah. so happy for them. Yeah. Time just changes grief. Sure. It just sure. makes it look different. And sure. some days it doesn't even do that. Like, I'll wake up some days and think I am so much worse off today than I was the day after burying her. Huh. Like I'll, that will happen. And then because we are taught in time, you'll always miss her and she'll always be a part of you. But in time, you'll just remember the good memories. So many times yeah. I'm told that. Yeah. And like, even from people who have lost people, because we're trained to say that. And I don't think it's true. So when it doesn't happen to you, you think you're doing it wrong. Mm. Or mm -hmm. what's wrong with you? You should be fine by now. So then what do we do? We mask. We either isolate or we mask. We isolate because we're alone and nobody understands what we're going through and we become angry or we become severely depressed or we mask so that we can go back to fitting in and not make people uncomfortable because we're sad all the time. And there are so many people walking around with that that we don't even realize. Yeah, for sure. And that's why I say time. Like if we could just learn that I don't need to treat you like you're in a permanent state of mourning, but I do need to acknowledge that your grief is forever part of everything you do yeah. and be okay giving a little bit of space for that yeah, yeah, yeah. in our relationship for you. Perspective is the truth and that's the gift, I think, from it. And, you know, when you ask, like, you know, going going through that here and, like, me being in a different city and all that, like, yeah. what did it do? With it? It, did, it, it did definitely give, like, enormous perspective. I think these conversations give me enormous perspective. And and, and one, one thing that I've, you know, again, from, like, noticing, you know, hanging out with you guys and, like, seeing you guys from both, like, close and from afar is I, I feel like you and your family – uh, from where I sit, just have this like just beautiful, super fucking healthy perspective on everything. The way you deal with like, let's just take basketball, to, you, you know, to, to get <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So like our kids, yeah. our kid, you know, now like youth sports are so insane. Our kids play for this like elite, like fucking like AAU basketball yes. thing. And, um, you know, it's insane. It's an insane fucking world. And we were all competitive athletes as parents together. So we're coming at this from a relatable perspective, but in a completely different time. Completely different time. So but we're, we're like, not coming from like where a lot of parents yes. are coming from. We're like, they never, it's so clear they never fucking played a sport. We're not in their vicariously life like, living through them. Yeah. We're just like, oh, they have to navigate a whole different world than what we did when we were elite athletes. Exactly. <laughs> and, and especially way different than when we were fucking 11, right? And like, at like 10. I didn't even start like, till I was 11. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Different, and, yeah. And, and so like, you know, our, our kids have like this, like enormous amount of fucking pressure on them. And, and, and I, you know, it is something like I'm navigating, you know, from, from, from Aaron's side of things, you know, like her uncle wins a gold medal in the Olympics. And then her brother from all opinions is better than him coming up. So she's coming up with a brother a year apart from him in where wrestling is like fucking everything in the world yep. and like in their house like Gospel. you know no furniture there's a the wrestling mat like Aaron had to wrestle her brother you, yeah. you, you, you know like and like when she would beat him like they her uncles would like pay her and and like you know like it was very intense just no balance no balance here we are trying to we want them to have this because it keeps them out of trouble. There's so many life lessons, relationships, the personal growth, teamwork. like the opportunity, like everything that comes from it. Like we see the value because that was beat into us. Yep. It was like, I'm not going to pay for college because you're going to get some form of a scholarship. Yep. Like our whole generation, you're going to go to college for free because of sports. Yep. Right. Yep. And it was just like so much emphasis. But now, so is mental health. But also, let's get them started at age three. 
becoming elite athletes. Yes, and kids <laughs> that are like literally five years earlier had shit in their diapers. Yes. Are now there's like a professional who's being paid to win games that your kid and yeah. like my kid, like your like like you know, our kids that play together. They're sort of like instrumental on like making that team, get, you know, like, yeah, like, yes. you know, and, and so then there's like also pressure. And they have the influence and I'm like, oh, my kid, a bad influence on your kid. Oh, well, so all sorry. that shit, yeah, right? So, yeah. so, but like I, what, you know, what I've seen th with you guys, with you and Ben, Ben is an athlete, you know, like comes like you guys are real fucking, it's like a real athletic family, like not. Again, there's no vicarious bullshit. And it's so clear with you guys that like the life lessons for saw are so much more important than the wins and the losses are yeah. so much more than the, and, 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 and yet, and, and, and yet, like, I, I feel like you guys, and, and I, I really struggle with it. Like I really struggle with my relationship with my kid in sports, but like, you know, I just, just talk a little bit about like what your perspective is on it, how you guys deal with it. Wh wh how do you feel you guys are successful and how do you guys feel like you're, you're, you're fucking up? This is where I think Ben and I both feel um, the weakest in our parenting. Wow. This is where we both feel like the like we're we're messing up every single day. We're doing this wrong. Um, or we have no idea how to approach this, or how do we remove ourselves from, you know, just to kind of summarize the situation of, you know, ki our boys who are incredibly competitive and highly obsessed with all sports and who place a lot of emphasis on winning. And unfortunately for Ben and I, um, they seem to be placing a lot of emphasis on their performance and on their record with their like personal value, which crushes me. It, it just crushes me. And um, Ben and I were not raised that way. We were raised by parents who were definitely parents of athletes and definitely like were rooting for success. But it was also like, and we're going to love you even if you don't ever play another sport. And you're going to be great even if you don't. But, like, really awesome that you're pretty good at this, right? <laughs> like, we really also love that you're good at this. And we love going to sports every weekend. And yeah. I love saying that my kid did holds this record or whatever. Like, yeah. we really love that. But also, we still love you if you don't want to play sports. Yeah. So, you know, that's kind of where we're coming from. Um, and now we have these two just really, like, intense kids with sports and we're talking not just playing sports but watching like you don't even know about that part like our whole house can fall apart if like their team doesn't win like the team really? they're rooting for their professional team it, oh, it, it is like their it's like their fan like it's oh. like it's happening to them i hate to say i love that so much so I like well it. when the lakers got kicked didn't make it through the playoffs <laughs> this year it was definitely a dose of humble pie i'm like oh i'm I'm an embarrassment to myself right now. Like this is, I even know better and I'm letting them see, like it's ruined my entire week. And Yours? I'm like sulking all throughout the house and my kids are like, uh-oh, do you think mom, like, it, and I'm like, oh my God. These are the Lakers? Yes. The La Listen, really? What I, a fucking, what a, what a, what a, man. excuse me. But that is a hard I team grew, to root for. I mean, I grew, fucking A, man. I grew the up Lakers? in LA. Look, so yeah, I got yeah. to watch the dynasty era as yeah, I come no, from I generations of Laker fans. Yeah. I remember where I was when like Ori hit the three point game winning shot when I was in yeah. high school. I remember the sound of like the whole neighborhood erupting. So yeah, I'm yeah. a little like, and I will say, like, full disclosure, that hasn't been every moment in every year of my life. But the tricky, murky part is a big part of our healing as a family has come through sports. Sure. And that is where we've – that's something that we all connect over. And it is a little bit religious to us. Sure. And um, and so for the boys, it when everything was dark – that was their light. That mm. was their escape. Mm. And and we encouraged that. Like, mm. we didn't see anything wrong with, like, when the pandemic finally ended, we could leave the house. Like, we went and watched their very first NFL games in person of their favorite teams. And that was the first trip that we took, mm. right? It was mm. to go see the Bills. And, mm. like, and those were some of our, like, most healing family moments. The murky part is that when you're healing and you're – joy is wrapped up in something that you have no control over and it doesn't it becomes really tricky to not take it personal now when that happens when it doesn't go how you plan 
they aren't realizing that they're crying over their team, you know, not making it to the Super Bowl <laughs> because when their sister was dying and that quarterback called them and poured love into them and told them how brave and strong and inspirational they were, that that moment got them through to the mm. next. So when their team loses the game, they're reliving that moment. Yeah. And they don't know that. And they can't articulate that. That's not conscious. They, they, it's yeah, not it's... even articulate. They're, they're not even aware. There's no right. way that they're aware of it, but their body knows it. Right. Their heart knows it. Maybe when they're older, they'll know that. But like, I'm watching it happen. Like, I'm watching them be heartbroken about that. So then they place that same emphasis on themselves. So it's this awkward balance of they were going to be competitive anyway. They were going to be obsessed with sports, even if their sister For didn't sure. get sick. But it also is where they put all of their energy and focus after she got sick. And when when I had to, again, when I had to come home from the hospital to tell them about their sister, um, I, ne I knew I needed to do it as quickly as possible before they found out from somebody, before it wasn't me delivering the message or before they were imagining different scenarios, like I needed to come home and do that. And so Ben was home with them. And Ben hadn't been able to be with Stevie yet because only one parent at a time at the hospital at Children's at that time. And so we you know, decided the, the boys needed to know. So we switched spots. And he came to the hospital to be with Stevie and I went home to tell the boys. And um, I mean, that that was worse than telling Ben and that was worse than the doctors telling me was having to tell them and not sugarcoat because – because they they needed to know and I I couldn't tell them five times so I had to tell them exactly how bad it was going to be the first time and Sawyer who does not express emotion my youngest and definitely doesn't like to let people see him cry unless it's in a athletic event um just fell apart and could like couldn't control himself hysterically and Wes who's a lot more comfortable sharing his emotions also fell apart but he was older than Sawyer at the time and he just looked at me and I'll, like he just like burned into my eyes and he goes how are we ever going to be happy again mm -hmm. and it was just of all things to say you know what I mean and what I didn't have like what was I gonna say right. in that moment? He's just how will we ever be happy again? And then he didn't stop. Then he goes, "We won't. We'll never be happy again. I'll never be able to be happy again. Why is this happening to us?" And um, mm -hmm. and you know, as a parent, you want to just rush to that silver lining so fast. Sure. You just want to rescue them from all of that pain, even though you know how important it is. You still would do anything to take it away. You sure. would. You would free them from every ounce of pain, even though you know how much that pain has blessed your own life, right? right. Like, I don't know why we're like that, but it yeah. is it is worse than experiencing your own pain is watching them in For pain. Sure. And, and I didn't have an answer. And as I'm like, my brain's going a million miles an hour trying to come up with some silver lining, the words just came out of my mouth. And I just said, I don't know. I don't know how we'll ever be happy again. I just know that we're going to figure it out together. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But you're not gonna do it alone. We will figure out how to be happy again together. And um, and I, I remember that moment when I see them falling apart today and it's so hard for me and Ben, like, because it just seems so irrational sometimes when they're falling apart and it's, it's exhausting and so trying on us that they take out so much of their own grief and pain that they don't know how to express. They express through sports and Oftentimes that is, it's not appropriate behavior, especially today, you know, um, that's really hard for Ben and I. Yeah. And, um, and we feel like we're failing because we, st we still haven't, like we can see what's wrong and we can't fix it. And it does not feel like anything we've done yeah. <laughs> has helped. Yeah. It's, it's not getting better. Yeah. It isn't. And, um, and then when it does get better, like when we have little periods where it's better, we can't identify what made it better. Right. We, so then it's like, what are we missing? Right. And then boom, it goes right back to every emotion in the world is being processed through sports. Yeah. And like I will say for anyone listening or watching this who's gone through something similar, like and navigating something similar with their own kids where you know maybe they've gone through divorce and 
they're acting out at school, which we've experienced, or, you know, whatever the personal situation, but if your kid's struggling and they've also gone through something hard, that um, that the therapists and the, you know, our hospice nurses, who they also provide a lot of, like, bereavement, like, counseling for you, and then our therapists following after CV pass and the kids' therapists all explain that, you know, kids are so resilient. We give them so much credit for how resilient they are because they continue to just like live and in a lot of cases thrive. But it doesn't mean that the trauma and the pain isn't still living in them and we just aren't seeing it because they're so, they learn how to mask. So here I hear like everyone saying how resilient kids are at overcoming. And I'm like, no, grief has just taught them to become experts at masking. Like they're just, they've learned that they have to fit in because every kid feels like they need to fit in. And to do that, they're gonna have to hide how they're really feeling in this moment, mm. which means it's gonna come out against their wishes at other moments. And so the the most helpful thing any of those therapists said is like, your boys, and for the age that they were at when this trauma happened, when they lost their sister, um, expect that they're gonna be doing pretty well afterwards. They, you might be surprised at how well they're doing. And in three years, you may be blindsided that they're going to fall apart or two years or one year or five years. But be just know that is don't be worried because when they were doing well shortly after, I was worried. Like that worried me that they were just adjusting so well. Meanwhile, my best friend's kids were in therapy over losing Stevie and my kids were just happy still and playing sports and playing video games and having their friends over and laughing and enjoying life still. And I was like, how are they okay? Mm. How are they not having nightmares? Mm. How are they not having panic attacks? Mm. Well, they are resilient and that they their survival instincts kicked in and then when things become safe again, the breakdown starts to happen. And that is in a way for Ben and I like reliving. For me, it's reliving that moment that I sat down and told them that their sister was dying. Yeah. Yeah. For yeah. Ben, um, it's him reliving the feeling of being helpless. So it, it's different for both. I mean, I definitely yeah, feel that yeah, too. Yeah. But mostly he goes back to how helpless he felt at fixing or helping his kids yeah. and saving yeah, I them. That. I, yeah. and, and, that, and, it, and that watching him feel that crushes me. Yeah. And what's our biggest struggle now is our kids are older and they're intuitive and they're sensitive because life has made them that way. And, and they can see that that's how we feel. And that's a lot of pressure. Yeah. And that's what therapy has helped me learn too is I'm like, well, no, we're protecting them from that. And they're like, yeah, but they're older now. And just like you could see how your parents were really feeling in those moments and you could read between the lines and you could tell when your mom was depressed, sure. your kids know. You might not be saying it and you might be protecting them from those really big emotions because we're really big on um, letting our kids see us grieve. Like we're not it's important that they know when we have tough days and that, sure. that we cry in front of them and that we talk about her all the time and we talk about what's hard and we talk about our anxiety and panic attacks or hard days or days when we're just feeling sad because we want to teach them to do that. We want to give them permission to do that. But then there's the fine line of them. We're a family. And yes, there's parents and there's kids and there's those defined roles of we're taking care of you, but they're human and it's human nature to take care of the people you love. And they're, as they get older, a big part of Sawyer that has m manifested itself to us in the recent months is that he's worried about us. He's worried about our healing. He's worried about if his dad's okay. Mm. He's worried about if his mom's frustrated with his dad. Mm. He's worried about us holding it together and um, he's worried about bringing her up and is that gonna make us sad or talking about having mm. her ask Wes finally opened up to his like school therapist and then came and she's like, he needs to talk to you about Stevie. And he came to us and he was like, asked us a bunch of questions about when she died. And I was like, you can always ask me these questions. And he said, well, I've been keeping these questions in for three years because I didn't want to make you sad. Mm. And that was just like, that's the opposite of what we wanted. And that's the opposite of everything we've done in our home. But it's, it still is what happened because they wanted to protect us and they didn't want us to be sad, yeah. you know? And I, and I see a lot of that coming out in sports. And so I know I'm not the only parent navigating kids with big emotions in sports. And so 
I don't have advice on how to make it better, but I do have insight on saying the behavior is just a symptom of the real problem. And you have to be willing to dig deeper to ask, to not just address their anger or their poor sportsmanship or their meltdown. We were not addressing that. We're trying to get to the bottom of like, what is causing, like that's coming from somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, and whether our kids wanna hear it or not, like it's really important that we try to make ourselves aware. Like what's leading to this behavior in my kid? And instead of pointing out the behavior all the time, how do I address what's causing it? It's just a symptom. Yeah, and, and, and I think being okay with the fact that it elicits like sometimes like a response out of, out of yourself that you're not completely proud of oh. or you're not. And, and that like if it makes, like you said, makes Ben feel helpless. Like, I, like I've seen, like I get it. And, and like, look, man, it's like, you know. I've, or I've, makes I've, me like, feel furious. Yeah. Or I've, I've, I mean, I've wanted to yeah. like strangle my kid out there yeah, so many yeah, times. Yeah, yeah. No, I get it. I get it. Me too. And, 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 but, but, but I guess that the perspective that you've been able to garner and articulate and share, have you seen moments where the, the where, where, where that's happened with the boys? Um, like in terms of sports and where they're struggling there, do you in mean? In, in terms of like, 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 like in terms of being on that boat and like what oh, you guys went oh, through. Oh, definitely. Right? I mean, every day positively and their empathy and like compassion that they're able to access in in true pain. They're also very age appropriate behavior of frustration, jealous, jealousy, impatience, blame. They do all of those things. They're not like superhero children. They do all the age appropriate stuff. But when it comes down to the less age appropriate stuff and it comes down to like their peers, true trauma and heartbreak and hardships, they're the first, um, they're the first to get on that level with them. Yeah, yeah. And they're the first to be physically affected by it, like just visibly you see them affected, you know, when one of their classmates' moms gets diagnosed with cancer. You just see them immediately go to how they felt and not make it about them, but be able to access their own personal experience and then perspective take for that person. Like, that's become a gift um, and a curse because that's a lot. Like, you're not – developmentally like you're not ready to navigate that mm -hmm. but life has forced you to mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. but reminding them how not alone they are with that like that's the big thing is grief is the most lonely road that so many of us are on like the irony in that like how lonely it feels and so really trying to take those opportunities for our kids to be like look how not alone you are in your pain right, right, i know right, that this right. feels like you're the only one on earth because wes was like he said multiple times, why does this stuff only happen to us? Yeah. And it's like, I wish it was only happening to us, yeah. but, yeah, man. but yeah. like, we're, we're talking about it, yeah. but it's happening to so many people around you, so many people you love and you just don't even know, or yeah. you, we haven't noticed until now. And now you're going to start noticing. Yeah. So they notice, Yeah. Um, they notice and they save space and they're a lot quicker to have grace for other people's unhealthy ways of expressing their trauma as opposed to their own. Yeah, so like my kid you. will be the first, so it'll be the first to have empathy for someone else's breakdown on a basketball totally. court and <laughs> be able to totally. fully understand why that kid is having a meltdown and comfort him and and feel bad for him. But when it's himself, it's just the refs are idiots. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, yeah. it's nothing yeah. emotional. Yeah. Just yeah. we should have won or yeah. I played bad or it's all like surface, but when it's other people, that's me saying like, oh, they do know. They do know, they just, it's just too heavy to face for themselves right now, it's so like they're so doing will, Like, yeah, he'll go off on a ref, but he's also the first guy to like befriend a ref and like, and like because really- Because that's who he is. Yeah, man. Like, that's how it's like, none of it is personal. It That's how I look and I'm like, okay, there's, there's hope. This isn't like a, this isn't telling me who my kid is. My kid gets mad at games and yells at refs, right? And does that make me terrified for his character and his future as a parent? Of course it does. <laughs> of course I've laid awake at night thinking about it. But I also know that those refs also, many of them love him and know him personally. And he has conversations with them and he hugs them and he has secret handshakes with them. That's right. And it's not because he's getting special treatment. It's because some of them are emotionally evolved enough to see his true nature and realize that 
he's just developmentally not evolved in that area yet. And it's not a personal reflection on them and it's not a sign of who he's going to be in the future. It's just like he just hasn't figured out that part. But at his true core, he's mad at himself. Mm. He's mad at what has happened to him. Mm. He's mad at circumstance. Mm. He's not mad at the ref for making a bad call. Yeah. Well, maybe yeah. he is. But, Sometime. well, they make but he doesn't – and they do. Yeah. But he doesn't – his out-of-proportion response is almost always about something else. What I'm going to acknowledge is I don't have this figured out. Yeah, this yeah, is, yeah. This does? is the Who thick does, of the though? parenting moment that we're in right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, and this is where Ben and I look at each other and we're just like, I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do not know heads from tails. And like, we have some days where we're like, all right, we got it. Totally. And then he just knocks us on our ass the next day and totally. turns it all upside down. And it's totally. like, just kidding. <laughs> totally. Curveball. <laughs> I'm not okay. Totally, <laughs> I'm still totally, a wreck. Totally. <laughs> <sighs> it's just a lot. And yeah. I think there's something to be said too about the age they're reaching. Um, the competition is much harder. Yeah. And when they were younger, they just got to be the best. Yeah, totally. It just got, it was just, totally. and, and like that's an addicting feeling, right? I, I, for sure. It is. And, and, and I think that, you know, when you have, I, I, and I think like the goal and the desire going forward is like to, you know, because look, it's, it's, it's part of the deal where they are. You know what we love so much about sports and, and and where they are in life in general is like the dream. Yeah, would be that Saw and Bill like sat down with each other and so I was like, you know, like I do this yeah. because I think I do this. Yeah, you know, what, man, like hey, Bill, like you might need a little bit more fire sometimes, dude. And like Bill, like you know, Saw, like just so you know, man, it's like I, you know, like when you're really upset, like come to me because I'm super, con you know what I mean? Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, you know, like the the hope is like eventually that these relationships. You know, are 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 going to be that that it's not going to need no. It's to an come. opportunity it's of a fucking huge opportunity and connection. Yeah. Oh, look at that. For sure. Here we go again. Yeah. For sure. And 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 that they're going to find it, you you, you know, move, moving forward in their own life, and it won't all be in relate because like we're not completely well, man. <laughs> you know, like totally. We don't have this fucking thing left, no. and and you just hope that there's enough you know, foundation that that's in there and, and, and we know their hearts are, are, are good that, that they're going to go out and, and, and try to both inspire and depend on, on the, the, the people that come into their lives, you know, like think of Kobe Bryant and I'm just going to pause with a little disclaimer there that I am not trying to compare my kids athletic ability to Kobe Bryant or a professional hey, athlete good, you know or I mean? like legacy wise. But in terms of like, that he just never apologized for how competitive he was. And, you know, who yeah. had to be a victim for him to get where he was? Yeah. And, like, is that right or wrong? I'm not going to say. I'm going to say that, like, it's a mentality for yeah. sure. Yeah. And, um, that you either have or don't. Yeah. yeah. And, and what I'm trying to figure out is how do I not spend so much energy trying to beat that out of him? Yeah. And really, like, how do we – channel that yeah you know yeah i don't know yeah can't wait to figure that one out yeah 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 i don't we'll know we'll be back when we do yeah yeah yeah, yeah if yeah. we ever do yeah 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 Gosh. yeah yeah um you is there anything else is there anything else that you want to talk about anything else you want to say anything else that, that anything you want to ask me mm, let me think ask you i mean yeah. listen, i mean the answer I just, can totally be no too i just made you like i just was like hey let's just talk about your own personal trauma whether that was off limits or not oh, let's no, just go no, into no, no no so feel free if that was cut out but no. you know i was hoping i was hoping that we were going to be able to kind of talk about like your own experience and that because again connection and um you know so i'm grateful to you for being willing to like knowing that so much of your life is doesn't get to be private and how sacred that is to you because here you are this just dichotomy of a human um in the public eye while also raising your family in, in an incredibly traditional way and striking that balance that I don't even know how that's possible right mm -hmm. so grateful to you for being willing to go to kind of that more sacred space knowing that it was going to help me feel safer going to mine so yeah and and i do i mean i i i guess that's it though is like I, I think i mean we've talked about it privately and we've talked about yeah. it with you it's like you, you know it's like we we it is we're, we're like enormously connected in in so many ways and through and through that really yeah. and and that we walked a similar path there you know yeah. and and uh and and everybody really can learn and grow and and gain 
perspective from this and, and realize that, 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 that this is, I mean, it is something that everyone's gonna kind of go through at some point. Yeah. I mean, just like what you said, like you and Aaron, as different as you are, you have that thing in common mm -hmm. that when you see something in someone else, you both recognize it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really just a signal to like, you know, us on the inside mm -hmm. and our values mm -hmm. and what we find important in relationships Faith, yeah. and mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, that's the thing that draws us to our, <coughs> that's where we're similar. And that's where Ben and I are the same, yeah. as different as we are. Totally. You said that, and I was like, yes, yeah. us too. Yeah, yeah. I can relate to that so And perfectly. we know it immediately. Yeah. We're like, just like the, them, yeah. And that's when people say soulmate. Like, yeah. you find that in your children, you find that in friends, you find that in a relationship, right? Yeah. And like, you have more than one. Like, yeah. if you're lucky, you get yeah, to have sure. more than one. For sure. Like, we obviously recognized that in you guys right away too, and could see um, just that unique ability that you have that both of you have to see, really truly see the people around you when they're, even when they're trying not to be seen yeah, yeah. and to see the scenario and, um, but ultimately to see like what they need in that moment and then be willing to give it to them mm. because you know that you're in a unique position to be able to do that. Like I've had the privilege of watching you do that, of being able to really quickly recognize what, a stranger needs in a particular moment that you're in a unique position to offer and then you do it hmm. because it's not about you hmm. and you've taken you know your success you've taken your influence um and you've taken like the gifts that you've had and that was a that's a choice you made that a lot of people don't make in your position and i think that you know your choice in wife and like your how your kids are is so obviously a reflection of who you are at your core too. So obviously I knew I was going to fall in love with her too and have. And, um, but I don't know how you knew I could sit here and do this with you <laughs> after the people oh, that really? you interviewed. Yes. Oh, dude. I, I thought I, I was like, like, are you kidding? This when you said it to Ben and Ben comes back to me and he's like, so John's like really like iffy about asking. I was so asking. nervous about that. And I was that like. That was the most nervous I've ever, of anyone I've asked to do this show, that was no, the one I was most nervous about. I was about. literally like, did, He's nervous because he's like, this is a terrible fit, but you know, let me just be really no, nice here. And Ash, that's no. what it felt like. That's what I was no, like. Oh man, no, well, I just I'm equally uncomfortable telling him, hell yes, let's let's chat about this. <laughs> like No, man. No. Might but, go a different direction than he's used well, like, to. Look, I think I think it, you you know, like I've been in awe of you guys since the the day I met you. And I, I just like, I don't know. I and I and I, I think more than anything else, I really believe that like what's in the core of 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 everything that you're you, you do and the way just the way that you guys live is you have like extraordinarily high levels of compassion for other people and you want to share and you you believe that there's a, a, a pain is something that can bring people together yeah. and 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 you, you you don't mask it and you're not like i don't know and like we live in such a fucking world now especially like on social media and even in this little fucking microcosm of a you fucking basketball where everyone's yeah, like bubble. my kids got to be the best like we're the best we're the best family we're this we have we're flawed you know and i just think that like it's exhausting beauty is fucking like honesty and like this is who we are and like that's and we just need more of it you know and agreed so, yeah. and that was your whole like that was your whole reason for starting this was yeah i remember you saying once like the voice for the voiceless not to imply that the people you interview don't have a voice but really um you know, taking people who are influenced by you and giving them access to just different perspectives and life experience. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. It's really well, cool. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate you doing it. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. you having me. Yeah. Fuck yeah. Even if I don't fit the mold. Uh, Let's mold. break the mold. Yeah. Break the mold. Yeah, what did you say? Mommy blogging? Yeah. I mean, that's that's what the genre is called. So you don't even know. Yeah, no, that's why you mean, don't even I'm realize how... <laughs> It's, it's a thing. Dude, believe me, I saw those women uh, lose their mind.